the thing we talked about was lots of examples of where we were using um, a charged nucleophile to attack our carbonyl bond. So at nine o'clock this morning, we looked at how to get a, a hydrogen charged and how to get carbon as a charged nucleophile. And those of you that weren't there, I recommend you go back and have another look at that. Okay. But if we've got a charged nucleophile, we're doing that reaction where we can attack our carbonyl carbon, we can break the carbon oxygen double bond, we get a tetrahedral intermediate, and then we protonate it. Okay, so we do the nucleophilic followed by the electrophilic. Um, if we don't have a charged nucleophile, or something which acts like a charged nucleophile, then we do a slightly different route. We do the electrophilic attack first, so we protonate our oxygen, or we add something to our oxygen to make it charged, then we do the nucleophilic attack. And again, you end up with the same kind of tetrahedral intermediate, and then at the end, we deprotonate, and we end up with our um, structure. So up till now, that's been fairly straightforward. Unfortunately, we've now got to look at nitrogen. And nitrogen just likes to throw a little bit of complications into that system. So what happens when we use nitrogen as our nucleophile? So if we take an amine and we react it with our simple carbonyl, so an aldehyde or a ketone, what generally tends to happen is we get that attack, but then we get loss of water. So we're going to look at the reaction mechanism first, okay, and then we're going to try and understand a little bit about why that mechanism happens. So what we're going to do in this case is we're going to form something that's called an imine. So we'll have a look at the structure of that as we go. So let's draw our standard... Um, carbonyl. Okay, so there's our standard carbonyl. The ones that are just chattering away, if they can just stop chattering away, it'll make everyone's life much easier. Right, and then we're going to use an amine. Okay, so we're going to have our amine here. So an amine... We're going to use a primary amine, so it's an NH2 group. Um, we can do this with some other kind of amines, but we'll look at that later. So we're going to take our primary amine. And what we're going to do is we're going to use that as our nucleophile. Now, of course, we haven't activated the carbonyl this time, but let's, we'll not worry about that for a minute, okay? An amine is a pretty good nucleophile to start with. It's got a lone pair of electrons that it's going to use, and nitrogen is one of those um, functional or atoms that it, it's quite happy to give up those electrons sometimes. It, it, it can act like a base, it can act as a nucleophile. Okay, so we've got this lone pair of electrons. Okay, and we're going to use that, and it's quite a strong, again, it depends on the nitrogen, but for our example, it's going to be quite a strong nucleophile. So we're going to do that starting reaction that we've done many times before. We're going to use the lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen and we're going to attack our carbonyl carbon. So exactly the same as all the ones we were doing earlier. The carbon then will have too many bonds, so we're going to break the carbon oxygen double bond. You'll see we're doing this in equilibrium. So what that's going to end up giving us is our O minus. And we've got our tetrahedral intermediate. Now, the nitrogen has used its lone pairs to form that new bond. So effectively, it no longer has control of both of those electrons. It controls one of them. The other one, it's effectively donated to the carbon. So the nitrogen in this then gets a positive charge. Okay. This is where... What we would have done in the past is we would have, I don't know, protonated the oxygen. Okay? Or do we deprotonate the nitrogen? And the answer is, well, actually, we can do both. So let me just show you what it's going to end, like, end up looking like, and then we'll discuss it. So what will happen is we can end up with deprotonating the nitrogen. Okay, and protonating the oxygen. The term we use for this is proton transfer. 
We're not going to show the mechanism about how this happens. So we're not going to show how the oxygen picked off the proton because there are so many ways it could do it. If you're doing this in water, for example, it could maybe take a proton from water. If there's any acid present, it could take the proton from the acid. Um, if it could take it from another molecule of our intermediate step where we've got the protonated nitrogen. So the oxygen could get that proton from lots of different sources. And we can't actually say which one would happen. So we don't have to worry about it. All we have to be aware of is, at this point, we can protonate and we can deprotonate. And it's all in equilibrium. So what we're saying is at some point in this equilibrium, we will end up with this species here, where the nitrogen no longer has a positive charge and the oxygen no longer has a negative charge. One of the protons from the nitrogen that gave it its positive charge has been transferred to the oxygen. Okay, so we end up with this tetrahedral species. The next bit is again an equilibrium, and that's when we add another proton. So with this other proton being added, what we now end up with Okay, is we end up, we're going to protonate the oxygen. We could add the proton onto the nitrogen, but then we'd just be going back to where we started. We'd be doing the reverse reaction if we added, if we protonated down at the bottom here with where the NH group is. And what you need to remember, that all of this is in equilibrium. So what we're saying is in solution at any one time, any three of these, the, these three species could all exist in equilibrium. Okay, but when we protonate at the top, when we protonate the oxygen to form OH2+, we spoke about it a little while ago, we've formed a very strong leaving group. Because when that leaves, it's going to leave as water. Okay, so that's a really strong leaving group. So because it's a strong leaving group, we can then say, well, what would happen if it did leave? So how would the reaction progress if we had that leave? So if we take the lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen, and instead of forming a carbon-oxygen double bond, we form a carbon-nitrogen double bond. Okay, so this comes round and forms a carbon-nitrogen double bond. What happens then? The carbon has got too many bonds attached to it. It's got five, so it needs to lose one. And at this stage, well, we've got a very good leaving group set up, ready to go. So the electrons in this bond here to the OH2 plus leave. And we end up with what's called the aminium cation. And then we would also have the water leaving group. And then finally, that very last step would be deprotonation. Okay, so we'd, we'd lose that hydrogen, again, much in the same way as we've lost them in previous steps. So it seems a little bit more complicated, but if you break it down, it's the same kind of mechanisms that we've been seeing before. Okay, we've got at the start, attack of our nucleophile onto our carbonyl group. It gives us this tetrahedral species in the middle where the oxygen is negatively charged and nitrogen is positively charged. We've seen that lots and lots of times before. You know, what we've then done in the past is um, protonated the oxygen, for example, or deprotonated the nucleophile. In this case, what we're saying is that the proton that's on that, not, that nucleophile can transfer to the oxygen. And then we're just saying, well, if we can transfer one proton, why can't we add another proton? So we've added a second proton. And then we've set the system up to have a leaving group. So we're almost then doing the reverse reaction. We're reforming a double bond. It's just this time it happened to be the nitrogen that's forming the bond. So it's a carbon-nitrogen double bond to give us what's called an imine. And you can see that imine is exactly like a carbonyl group. It's just it's not a double bond to oxygen. It's a double bond to nitrogen. And the only thing that we need to be aware of is that we do this in slightly acidic conditions, okay? So it's kind of pH 6 to pH 8. 
So at the start, we would be doing this at pH 6. And that's because we need that proton. But if we use too much acid, if we were to put in something like HCl, the problem there is that our amine at the start, so if you put too much acid in this, would end up being NH3+, plus, and that wouldn't be a very good nucleophile. It wouldn't be nucleophilic at all. So if you see these kind of imine reactions, you will see that we will give you some guidance. You know, the pH is about 6 to 8. But we've got our imine. So I guess the, the most important thing for us to start to understand is, why does this step happen? Why is it that we are protonating on the nitrogen and not on the oxygen? And so we'll just think about that on the next slide. So in this reaction mechanism, there is an equilibrium between protonation of the oxygen and protonation of the, the nitrogen, the amine part. So if we draw that in now, um, we have our OH. And we have our okay. So we have the OH and we have the NH. And we've got a couple of options here. Okay, we could protonate the oxygen or we can protonate the nitrogen. So if we protonate the nitrogen, which is what we've um, which would be going back to where we started from, okay? Okay, so if we protonate the nitrogen, what do we end up with? What products do we end up with? Well, we reform our carbon-oxygen double bond and we lose the nitrogen. So if you go right back to the very first um, lecture, I talked about the reversibility of these carbonyl reactions. So all I'm doing here is that same reversibility. I'm saying we've added our nucleophile and then we're saying, but of course we can reverse that reaction. We can take, reprotonate the nucleophile, make it a good leaving group and make it leave again. So if we do this, we would go back to our carbonyl. Yeah, so that is just the reverse reaction. If you, like I said, look back on the first lecture slide, there's a little bit right at the end about reversibility. So this is just the same as doing that. But what about if we were to protonate on the oxygen instead? So we protonate on the oxygen. Okay, we end up with a very similar species. If you look at those two, I've deliberately drawn them, you know, one above the other. They are exactly the same, except for in this, the bottom one, the oxygen has got the extra proton, in the top one, the nitrogen has the extra proton. So now what happens with our reaction mechanism? Well, we form this carbon-nitrogen double bond and we get water as a leaving group. And we would end up with this imine, or aminium cation. So what we have to think about is, so we, are, we know that the equilibrium actually favours this. And there's lots of complicated reasons why. Um, one of them is to start looking at the pKa of things. You haven't done pKa with us yet, so you'll be looking at that next term. But we can actually make a much more simplified understanding. If we look at the top one, the oxygen has got the positive charge. Now, oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen. So if it had the choice, it would not want to have that positive charge. If there was a choice, it wouldn't go with the oxygen. And we do have a choice here, because this is in equilibrium. So the nitrogen, less electronegative, more willing to give up an electron and to become positively charged. So it makes a lot of sense that forming the aminium cation at the bottom 
is favoured because the nitrogen being positively charged is less unfavourable than the oxygen being negatively charged. So as I said, oxygen does not like to give off its electrons, whereas the nitrogen is a little bit happier to do that. Okay, so all you have to figure out is just, just know that that, that equilibrium lays more towards protonation of the oxygen in this. Um, so protonation of the oxygen here is more favourable. One, you get water as a really solid leaving group. And two, the eventual product is, I guess, more stable, more energetically favourable than the one at the top. And the other thing we'll just look at is, again, it may look like I'm giving you a different mechanism, but we've already seen this mechanism before. So if we go and consider, if we compare this to acetal formation, which we did, we can see that actually the mechanism is very, very similar. So in this example, let's see, we've got what we're we starting with. We've got our R group. We've got our OH. We've got our NA. We've got something else. So this is the imine version. When we looked at the acetal version, we had R, OH. Remember, we'd added the alcohol group to it, yeah? Do you remember acetal formation? We added methyl, methanol to it, for example. So we ended up with an, an oxygen bonded to some other kind of carbon. Okay? But you can see, as you look at those two, the only difference is this NHR versus the OR. So now, if we do our proton or protonation, in this example, we're protonating up here. And in the bottom example, we're also protonating in the same place. Okay? So, that's, we've seen the acetal formation. This is the same reaction mechanism that's going on. Then in the top one, we are going to use our lone pair from our nitrogen to form our carbon-nitrogen bond, and we're going to make water leave as a good leaving group. And that's going to leave us with our aluminium cation. And in this example, we're going to use the the bonds, the lone pair of the oxygen to form our carbon-oxygen double bond, and again, we're going to kick out water. And you can see both of those things look very similar. The only difference here is that what we're able to do at this point is deprotonate, what we did in the bottom one, if you remember, is we had our, our alcohol come in and react again. Okay, so the acetal formation went on a little bit further, but the imine formation would stop at this point. Okay, so you can see that although it may look like we're, again, showing more mechanistic chemistry, it's the same one you've seen already. We're just applying it slightly differently. We're just changing one or two atoms in it, but it follows the same kind of reaction mechanism. So the only thing we then need to think about is, okay, if we've got an imine, how, how does that react? If you remember with some of these things, we said... If we go back to the aromatic chemistry, we created you know, a product that was more reactive, so it would go on and react again. In the case of forming an imine, are we creating something which could react again? And the answer is, yeah, it can just react just like um, a carbonyl group can. So we can think of all of the reactions that we've looked at with carbonyls, they could happen with an imine as well. So we'll, we'll have an example of, well, we'll look at one example of one of those. So we can think of imines as nitrogen analogues of carbonyl groups. So very simply, that 
is very similar, as you can see, to that. Yeah? The, the, the carbon in that carbonyl is going to be electron deficient still. In the imine, perhaps it won't be as electron deficient, okay, unless we've protonated it again. Okay? So it, it will be slightly less reactive in, if, they are, if everything else is equal, because the nitrogen won't pull the electron density away from the carbon as much as the oxygen does. And again, that's the difference in the electronegativity. With an oxygen, it will pull them away much more than with a nitrogen. Okay, and so let's have a look at a reaction mechanism that might happen. So if you look at, for example, using, doing hydrolysis. So we haven't done hydrolysis yet, but that's just the addition of water. So if we take our imine, okay, and I've just said it, it's not as reactive as we might want it to be. So we will need to make it a little bit more reactive. So there we've, we've activated our, our imine. So by protonating the nitrogen, now the nitrogen, the electrons in that carbon-nitrogen double bond are going to be much more drawn towards the nitrogen because it's already electron deficient. That makes the carbon more reactive because the carbon's now more electron deficient. And then we can have the reaction with a, with a nucleophile. So in this case, we're going to use water. And we're going to use the lone pair of electrons on the water to act as our nucleophile. Okay? That's going to react with that carbonyl carbon. We're then going to break the carbon-nitrogen double bond this time. So again, the carbon's still going to have too many bonds. So we've now got this, we've added our water, but of course that's, we know, a pretty good leaving group. So it could just reverse back the other way. It could all leave again, but it's in equilibrium. There is the ability for this proton transfer to happen. So we can do a proton transfer, which means that the nitrogen gets positively charged. Okay, the oxygen loses that positive charge, so suddenly it's now become an OH group. The OH group isn't as good a leaving group as it should be. We also know that, you know, if possible, the nitrogen getting a charge is, is favourable. And then from here, we can then do our reaction. We form our carbon-oxygen double bond, and we get the amine to leave. And we end up with our amine, which of course you can recognise was what we had at the start. So of course the amine could then react with the carbonyl again and go back round the cycle. But there are lots of ways in which we can force it one way or the other. We don't need to worry about it right now. And then finally we can deprotonate. Okay, we end up back to our carbonyl. So I guess what I'm trying to make you understand, all of these reactions are a lot of them are reversible, and so that means there's an equilibrium at play. Now, we can push things one way or the other with our equilibrium. Um, we don't need to go into great detail now about what we would do for that to happen. I guess what you need to understand with these mechanisms is you need to think about how, does, how can I do the mechanism that moves me forwards? You know, if I'm going to be asked for what would be the reaction between these two things, or how do I get from one product to another, you need to think of drawing your mechanism. We know it's an inequilibrium. We know that lots of things can happen, but as far as an exam question is concerned, we want to see you draw some mechanism that gets you to where you need to be. Okay, and this is just showing you that you know the imine can react in a very, very similar way to a carbonyl. So if you think I've seen the carbonyl reaction, if I've got an imine in my product in my drug, in my structure, it can react in the same way. So, 
with that in mind, we've got a slightly more complicated um, example now. So what I want you to have a go at is, first of all, do that reaction mechanism. So we've got our amine, we've got our carbonyl. They are going to react to give us an imine um, reaction or functional group, which is the one in the middle. And then, this morning, those of you that didn't come, you're going to find this a little bit harder than those that did. Um, you then need to draw that sodium borohydride reaction. Okay, so show me how we can go from one to the other. We start with our carbonyl, we form an imine, and then that imine can undergo the same reactions as the carbonyl, so it can undergo a hydride reduction with sodium borohydride to form an amine at the end of it. So have a go at doing that. 